we had finished with the uh, the contact process which we discussed but i i just thought i will ask you that having seen the contact process uh, as it is uh, practiced do you see any uh, opportunities to improve over the process uh, as we have discussed or uh, do you think that there is any opportunity to think differently okay. need not necessarily be better uh, but to think differently any idea or anything that came to your mind or you think the contact process is perfect and shall always remain that way let me uh, take you through something uh, which is somewhat different it still uh, uses the same catalyst and everything uh, but what these people have tried to do it's uh, done by the russians uh, is that uh, they they tried to ask that is it possible to do this whole process uh, in an adiabatic manner well they must have had their own reasons for uh, uh, wanting to try it out you'll find some uh, more details on this in this uh, book by uh, molin uh, it's known as adiabatic reactor with periodic flow reversal what did we see that when you are introducing the feed into let's say the the first bed catalytic bed right we found that the temperature initially is uh, uh, not so high but as the reaction takes place it gets hotter and hotter and in fact from something like uh, 430 degrees uh, it went up to about 600 degrees celsius so obviously as it was reacting it was releasing heat Uh, and so it became hotter now what uh, these people said is that what happens suppose uh, we take some inerts you know uh, with a very high heat capacity so th they had some an inerts over here and uh, what they are also doing uh, is that uh, they are saying that look when we are going this way Uh, this is the cold side and then it gets hot what they will do is that after some time uh, they will reverse the flow so you can see like the uh, black is the valves are closed and the uh, white is the valves are open so the feed is coming this way this valve is open is going this way and as it is going through it's uh, getting hotter and hotter and uh, then it's exiting from here then it's coming this way and uh, basically it will finally uh, uh, go into uh, it will be in the product okay stream after some time so they will basically do it the reverse way that is they will close this pulse and then open this pulse this is the second part so they have opened this so it's now coming this way and now exiting this way and off it goes so what they were saying is that when it gets hotter in the first uh, part of the cycle uh, maybe the feed stream uh, can be introduced at a somewhat lower temperature and and so what you do uh, is that you make use of this heat you know to then heat it up and as it is going through now this part is the colder part so as it is going through now it is reacting and this part will again get hotter so this part will get colder because uh, the feed stream got heated up by the hot stuff here okay so it will get colder and this part will get hotter so uh, uh, sort of sequentially uh, this part and this part are getting hotter and or colder okay so uh, and they have managed the inerts in a way uh, that there is sufficient amount of uh, inert Uh, so that i don't need to extract the heat it's just absorbed by the uh, by the inert as required the uh, the inert will also release the heat in case i need to heat up a uh, a cold stream so uh, that's what they're doing you can see at the start of a cycle for example uh, the temperature of the inert is uh, low the catalyst is high so this part is also low so that's what it is at the end of the cycle what happens uh, is that the catalyst is uh, getting hotter as you are uh, 
proceeding. So that's what they are basically trying to show here. And uh, what will happen is that the inerts are hot, so the they will release uh, energy to the uh, to the feed stream. Uh, feed stream may be a bit colder, uh, so the inert temperature will drop. On the other side, the inert temperature will rise. You know, so effectively that's the uh, way they have uh, done it. Uh, let me also tell you that uh, uh, there are a few plants in Russia that actually work uh, based on this uh, uh, adiabatic uh, uh, reactor with periodic flow. Okay. Uh, reversal. So, so they actually do it. So it's not a, a very useless thing. There might be uh, some advantages uh, of this. But let me tell you, the majority of the world doesn't practice it. They practice the conventional uh, uh, process. But sometimes, you know, it could be just the dominance of the Americans and all in uh, pushing their technology. Many times it happens because of that, not necessarily because it is the best technology. Uh, but uh, even so, uh, do you see any drawbacks uh, with this particular uh, uh, approach? You know, that's what I've asked over here. What would be some of the key constraints uh, of this process? Do you see any constraints? Sir, the time in which uh, a, a given amount of product is formed is... Uh... Is uh, longer? Yes, sir, is longer. But why should that be? Sir, because we are accounting for the change in the time required change, for the change in flow also. Change in flow would be almost instantaneous. I, I don't think that there will be a, a, a time lag. But let me put it down. What you're saying, uh, actually indirectly, it's right, but for a slightly different reason. You are saying time required uh, may be longer uh, because of the switchover, right? Yes, sir. That's what you are saying, isn't it? Huh? Okay, uh, good point. Hmm. Anything else? Anything else that comes to your mind? A couple of points should come uh, logically. So the catalyst is not used completely. Catalyst is not why catalyst is used completely. This is the catalyst bed. You know, as it is going through, there's no difference over there. Uh, you're flowing uh, the stream uh, through the catalyst bed. So it's passing through the entire amount of catalyst. So maybe the inerts need to be replaced regularly, uh, which can. Why why should the inerts be have to be? You mean if they're unstable, huh? Yes, and further, the wear and tear may also be caused okay. because of the uh, continuous heat flow. May need to be uh, may need to be replaced. Be replaced because of wear and tear. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Not sure, but anyway. Uh, so one more thing that we are assuming that. Uh, that the heating, like, is it only for one cycle that we are considering and after each cycle it is switching? Yeah, yeah, each cycle is having that and it's continuously going on and on uh, uh, the same way. It's a, it's a process that keeps repeating. Uh, so, as in I'm saying that uh, if we have one batch, yeah. we are sending it from the first route and then yeah. another batch we are sending it from the another route. Not Is another that batch. Are, are we? Huh, another batch means uh, you are saying the next lot of uh, feed. Yes, sir. But it's a continuous process. It's not a uh, batch process. Yeah, okay. Let's even assume that you can consider it as a batch. Uh, that you send a certain amount and uh, uh, the next lot we consider it as another batch. Okay, so then what? Sir, what I have you? a different point, sir. Yeah. So the walls may not close properly or there may be some problem in the walls. Okay. Uh, Mechanical uh, variant. Uh, uh, valves uh, may not close and open properly. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Five more seconds. Any other points? Think about... Uh, 
the fact that the product is coming out in both cases to the same place, right? See, what happens is that in one cycle, this is your feed, right? Your feed is coming, right? Now, in the next cycle, uh, it's coming the other way. There can be a problem of a little bit of residual feed, which might be left over, which can mix with the uh, product. You know? And so there could be a contamination uh, of product with feed, right? Unless yes, uh, you are flushing it out sufficiently, and in which case uh, you may lose time and some of the other things that you mentioned about, uh, but there could be a mixing of feed and product stream. Does that seem logical? Yes, yes sir. sir. That's what I'm trying to say, that look at the easiest, quite obvious thing, which is one side is feed and one side is product. Mixing of feed and product streams. OK? Anything else which may be a disadvantage? Now, you know, if you are going to put inert to mop up so much of heat, uh, you will require uh, quite a bit of this inert volume, even if you have a high heat capacity. So what will happen uh, is that my catalyst bed uh, will actually become a lot more unwieldy. It will be a lot bulkier. Uh, this whole uh, uh, thing. So uh, my overall overall bed volume would be much higher because of the volume of inerts. Agree? Agree or not? Yes, sir. Maybe you can try and think if there are uh, any other point uh, that come to your mind, please do that. Right. For those who are interested, I've deliberately put this reference so that, you know, if you're interested, you can read it up. But the, and another thing is very interesting that this is quite a recent uh, innovation. It is not, uh, uh, you, you know, that uh, the contact process was around 1913 developed and even the buyer uh, double absorption uh, came in the uh, early 60s, okay? And here we are talking about another, uh, what? Close to about uh, uh, 15, 16 years after that, uh, that this kind of an approach was uh, uh, devised. So uh, interesting, but at least what you can see is that even in very mature things, there is an opportunity to think in a different way. Every time you think differently is not necessarily going to be uh, a better thing in the long run. But even to be able to think of something different is not easy. I mean, you may reject it for a variety of reasons, but certainly in my mind, even the thought wouldn't have come to my mind. What these people have uh, uh, thought of, and yet I think it's quite smart you know, that uh, uh, they are uh, really looking at the unevenness in the temperature profiles of the inlet and the outlet and seeing how they can take advantage of that. Not bad at all, at least in, in terms of a, a, a thinking. All right? All clear? Yes, sir. Okay. You all are uh, going to become engineers, and engineers uh, are really uh, not just about concept. Engineers have to put things into practice, and they have to make it perfect. Even if you take, like, let's say a simple thing, right? Like, say, the absorption of SO3 into sulfuric acid. We said, right, uh, it happens twice over, uh, double absorption, fine. But in both cases, you have to really absorb the uh, SO3. Uh, now, uh, let's look at uh, what are the uh, issues. Like, for example, if you don't have a proper uh, control over the, uh, the inlet uh, H2SO4 stream into which the uh, SO3 is getting absorbed, uh, and we know that the exothermicity uh, can be very different if uh, uh, if you put it in water and put it in 
uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, so you have to be careful that you are uh, controlling it over a uh, very well determined uh, temperature range. So that's uh, 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 important. So one is the concentration and the second is the temperature of that uh, uh, absorbing liquid. So the temperature is kept at around 70 to 120 degrees centigrade. You, you don't want to have uh, uh, things which are uh, very cold or very hot. So they need to be uh, maintained at a certain temperature. Obviously, it means that you have to have data loggers and sensors which are uh, able to, uh, uh, thermocouples which are able to monitor temperature, monitor concentration. Then, for example, uh, I have got a heat of absorption as I am generating heat. Obviously, my temperature may go beyond this uh, range. And so what I will need to do uh, is that I will have to have heat exchangers uh, which can uh, remove the uh, surplus heat so that I always remain in this uh, uh, temperature window. So uh, I will have to have heat exchangers and you'll have to make sure that those heat exchangers have not got corroded uh, because otherwise, you know, their performance can uh, deteriorate. So uh, obviously being able to uh, monitor and second, uh, it has to be designed in a way that it's not getting corroded by sulfuric acid. So it has to be passivated, right? So you have to check for those, uh, whether the surface is intact, uh, whether any problems are developing. Suppose, let's say the inlet stream uh, uh, on which I did my contact process, uh, suppose let's say uh, I, I put over there dry air, uh, but let's say the air was not sufficiently dry. Okay. For whatever reason, maybe a, uh, a improper uh, monitoring of the process. Now, uh, what then will happen is that as my SO2 is getting converted into SO3, you know, and there's moisture there. Now, obviously that moisture is going to soak up the SO3 right and now instead of just having a gas phase uh, i'll generate like a mist and it will be an acid mist so uh, there will be uh, some very very fine droplets of sulfuric acid uh, which will be suspended uh, in that uh, air so2 uh, uh, stream <coughs> now what happens is funny as it may seem but when i've got that kind of a mist and that is being passed through the absorbing liquid, the sulfuric acid. Sometimes what can happen is that along with the, uh, the gas phase, you know, the mist just basically passes through the uh, liquid without getting absorbed. So mist can sometimes be, uh, uh, you might actually end up with higher levels of pollution, acid pollution, okay, because the mist has uh, not got fully uh, absorbed. So in that case, someone has to monitor the formation of mist and you need some kind of an acid filter with which you can remove the mist. And then again, we saw the temperature of the incoming gas, the SO3, SO2 steam, etc., which I'm uh, passing through the sulfuric acid. Uh, obviously, uh, that has to have a temperature control uh, because otherwise, uh, it can affect the rate of absorption. So you can see that even for something as simple as SO3 absorption into sulfuric acid, there are so many things to monitor. And that's the, these are the details that engineers have to look out for. So it's not just about having a conceptual idea about a, a process. The real uh, attractiveness of these processes comes from understanding the finer details and how you circumvent uh, problems. Is that all clear to everyone? Understood? Yes, sir. Okay. We've looked at the contact process. What if we say that uh, today all of the H2S, I mean, essentially all, comes from uh, crude oil processing. You, know? you uh, process crude oil, do the hydro treating, and from there you recover H2S, and that is the H2S being converted into sulfur or sulfur dioxide. Uh, so th that's that's what you are doing. You know, now the point is that uh, uh, there is no doubt about it. We have discussed this in the introductory uh, lectures, but 
look i mean this crude oil is coming to an end crude oil may last you another 40 50 maybe 100 years at most so what's going to happen after that i mean you won't require sulfuric acid where is it going to come from in india we don't even have a pyrite ore uh, we were one of the largest importers of crude oil we don't make our own crude oil reserves are very low as we have seen uh, but okay i mean uh, you were importing crude oil but you may not be able to import this there will be nothing available and there will be uh, fights over who will get that uh, last bits of uh, crude oil that will be available so there's going to be a massive shortage and so we will have to look at alternative sources of sulfur oh so why can't we recycle whatever we are using like oh wonderful recycle means you are talking about the sulfuric acid right yes sir brilliant huh. so y- you can see so there are two points that i have written over here okay one are there opportunities for production of sulfuric acid from unconventional feedstock that's one the second is really focused on what you are saying that what can be done with spent sulfuric acid does it answer your question i mean or at least has your question been taken into account yes sir that's very nice uh, that you have uh, mentioned it and i'll just also put it uh, also pointed out by a student as a possibility excellent the beauty is uh, when you look at uh, any problem uh, from what we call as cradle to grave you know that is in the beginning the cradle what what would do i have with me uh, which will be my feedstock etc and after sulfuric acid has done its job what happens to it where does it go obviously people are not consuming sulfuric acid so uh, it must be ending up somewhere majority of it you may not be able to recover like for example uh, 60 to 70% uh, goes for fertilizer uh, to make uh, all kinds of fertilizers especially phosphate fertilizers once i apply fertilizer in the field i can't get it but the beauty is that the fertilizer as such does not have sulfate in it i use the sulfuric acid to create phosphate fertilizer but that sulfate as we'll find later on actually becomes gypsum so it will be very interesting uh, to look at all kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of co products uh, which get generated uh, which again i might be able to convert into sulfuric acid okay yeah. so that's a brilliant question you have asked okay yeah. uh, very nice now let us try and look at these kinds of uh, sources okay i am not saying that Uh, they, uh, they will all come with their associated uh, difficulties. While uh, I might be uh, advocating something, uh, it it is not free of trouble or problem. So let us look at. Uh, but it's this is also true that as we are going to come to the end of certain resources, you cannot talk about something as just being a problem. Like coal is a problem. Yeah, coal is a problem. Now the smartest people, the people who end up uh, really making money, uh, opening new industries, are people who see opportunities in problems. Not the people who keep rattling off problems, okay? but people who can not only identify problems but see opportunities. They are the winners. They are the ones who will. Uh, Uh, actually be able to start industries of the future so take for example what we consider as the problems of let's say indian coal okay this is indian coal and uh, this is coal from uh, abroad now we have been importing uh, a lot of coal now even though we are one of the largest reserves of coal certainly it will last us a few hundred years you know uh, if not a thousand years let's see uh, what are the problems and why people uh, actually uh, 
uh, import coal, even though uh, we have, and today you know what's happening with the power situation, that coal prices have increased by more than a factor of three. Like we used to get coal from Indonesia, but they jacked up their price by a factor of three. Uh, Australia, another source of coal, but uh, all the rest of the world is trying to get out of coal. And uh, so India is in a very precarious uh, situation that we've got about, uh, what, about 70% uh, of our power generation is from coal. Mm -hmm. And people are telling us, you will not use any more coal. You're polluting the environment. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. So let's see what is the problem. Mm -hmm. One is that our coal has a lot of ash, 40 to 50%. And because of which the calorific value, the coal is low. And that's why a lot of people import it. Because otherwise, you have to reckon with a huge amount of ash. And there are mountains of ash, fly ash. Until, let's say, about uh, 15 years back, there was absolutely nothing that people could do with these ash. And it was just creating mountains of waste. A lot of work has been done around 2003, 4. Around that time, at least I remember seeing a lot of good work, you know, in even in India around uh, that time, and where uh, people started uh, using it in the construction business. You know, some of the regular things that they were using, uh, they could uh, substitute with fly ash. Now it's been approved, and so uh, many of our buildings, and especially you know things which are uh, not the very strong walls and things like that, uh, but like if you're making a fencing uh, or a, uh, a boundary wall, etc. I mean, uh, you can make, or if it's a uh, one-story house, you're not uh, talking of a lot of strength that is required, uh, you can actually use uh, fly ash. Uh, it's been allowed now. Okay. Second, I, I remember about three years back, uh, Tata Powers has come to us uh, for certain discussions and uh, they had uh, issues around power and uh, some of the feedstock and things like that. And one of the things you're talking about is, of course, the fly ash. And because I knew that uh, fly ash has a lot of silica. Indian fly ash, particularly, has a very high silica content. I just casually asked them that, is it possible to convert this ash into silica? And they said, you know, believe it or not, that's one of the technologies that we are working on, trying to make sand convert ash into sand uh, because of the high uh, uh, silica content in ash. And we are not the only ones, you know, I was seeing this uh, YouTube video recently. Uh, you can see 100% sand from fly ash. And you know that there's a huge problem in our country of uh, uh, sand shortage for building industries, you know, because people have been just uh, denuding our uh, uh, coast. You know, just taking away the sand from there, creating a problem. Yeah. So imagine if, uh, uh, for example, the ash can be converted into sand, uh, that will be great. It can solve uh, a lot of problems. So you need not necessarily see it as a, a problem. Uh, you could see it as an opportunity. Now, uh, imported coal uh, has uh, fairly high levels of sulfur, 1.8%. Ours is uh, not so high. I mean, 0.5% in that sense, it is better. But even 0.5% is a fair amount of sulfur. Uh, because in any case, we have to burn more coal uh, because the calorific value is only half. So we have to burn twice the amount of coal to uh, uh, to uh, uh, get the same amount of power. You know? So uh, the question is, this thing, sulfur, uh, is coming off as what? Is coming off as what will be the sulfur gas? SO2. Yeah, SO2. Because at the temperature of the uh, thermal power plant, and you remember the uh, the equilibrium uh, plot, it will all be SO2. There will be no SO3. See, uh, why not use that as a source of sulfuric acid? What would be the problem compared to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the SO2 that we get from the clouds process? Impurities. Absolutely right. Impurities. Why not use the sulfur emission as feedstock? 
for uh, uh, for sulfuric acid acid student only uh, impurities no? impurities may be a problem absolutely not maybe it will be a problem so separation is also a problem yeah yeah impurities means impurities may be a problem separation you have to separate the impurities otherwise it will poison your catalyst may be a problem because of steel pore because of catalyst poisoning uh, separation of impurities may be a non trivial correct have i included both your points yes sir yes sir so uh, these are the issues but i hope you can see what drives research that so you've got a problem now before you a person who is able to solve these problems could have wonderful opportunities uh, before him or her or companies who can solve these problems okay that what research is all about research is not about that uh, you only develop an understanding of problems which have already been solved you have to focus on unsolved problems but they are important problems let me uh, take you uh, through uh, another example although this was uh, really a fairly small quantum as a resource uh, but nonetheless uh, it is something that was done and for which now ict has a, a patent granted this year you know patent along with uh, a company rubemen any time you see a problem uh, you can say did i see something like this can i make use of this so let us uh, look at what they were doing this company takes uh, all this refinery catalyst so all this hydrocreating uh, catalyst you know uh, which are like uh, nickel molybdenum uh, vanadium uh, these are the kinds of uh, metal catalysts that are used in uh, hydrocreating of uh, feedstock they always get poisoned okay after some time so there is a huge amount of these spent catalysts which get generated the world over and this company in baroda has become now one of the biggest in the world uh, what they do is that they have tied up with a lot of companies all over the world including india and they take the spent catalyst and why do they take it because they are experts at recovering nickel and molybdenum and vanadium they they have got uh, excellent understanding of these uh, five or six uh, elements Uh, cobalt, uh, copper, uh, nickel, molybdenum, vanadium, and tungsten. So these are the six that they specialize in, and they have mastered the uh, technology for removing these. So the whole idea is they remove these metals, and they again give it back to these industries which produce the catalyst. And so then again that gets recycled. Now the problem is that when these spent catalysts come, they are loaded with organic. Uh, there is a lot of organics which uh, uh, which are there so the first thing that they have to do is that they have to carry out a combustion and uh, remove all the uh, organics and only after that can they do the extraction of these uh, uh, metals uh, hydrometallurgy and uh, whatever else they do so there is a roasting process so the catalyst has to be roasted when it is roasted uh, you uh, you are basically passing Uh, air and uh, all the organics is getting burned now because it's a hydrocreating uh, catalyst for sulfur removal a lot of sulfur also is deposited in this catalyst and so when you are uh, uh, roasting so in the flue gas you will not just get co2 from uh, organics uh, you will get a fair amount of so2 and so3 why so2 and so3 because what they have found is that for them the optimum temperature of roasting is around 500 to 650 degrees celsius if you look at this plot 
what you find is that around the temperatures at, of where they're interested, the 600 degree means what? You're talking about uh, something like uh, close to about uh, 870 degree uh, uh, Kelvin. So you're talking about a point somewhere here. And you can see at this point, I will get a mixture of SO2 and SO3. So that's what they were getting. Huh. Now, what they had to do was they cannot just let out this flue gas into the atmosphere because you know there'll be a huge amount of acid rain. So they were mandated by the pollution control board that they will have to clean up the acidity uh, in the flue gas due to uh, socks and knocks and things like that. And only after that they can discharge uh, their flue gas. What they were doing was they pass it through sodium hydroxide. That's what they were doing and converting it into sodium uh, sulfate sulfide. And they said oh, NaOH is very costly and uh, our uh, streams have got fair amount of SO2, SO3. <coughs> and uh, we have a problem and we want to reduce the cost of treating the uh, uh, effluent stream, the gaseous effluent. And can you help us? Uh, in fact, a couple of uh, masters uh, students from chemical engineering, uh, they worked on this problem. They actually went and stayed in this company for what, almost two, three months, you know, uh, working on this. Now, let me ask you, what would you do? Can you think of any solution to reducing the cost of the neutralization, etc., from all that you have learned till now? Sprinkle water, like proper spraying of water. Spray the water. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Very good. If you spray the water, then what will happen? So, all the suspend, so if there is some uh, suspended particulate matter, uh, that will settle down or even the SO2 or SO3 might react. Well, SO3 will react. Not yes, uh, SO2. You know, SO2 will probably pass. Combust it with air and then spray water so that SO2 gets converted into SO3. Combust it? Yes, sir. Combust the flue gas. With air and then uh, yeah, spray you water have to on do it. a second stage of uh, uh, roasting. That's what you're suggesting. Isn't yes, it? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, but yes, then uh, where you'll convert uh, the SO2, the rest of the SO2 into SO3, right? Huh? Yes, sir. Which is what? So, what are you saying? What, will you, what do you want to do effectively? How is that done? What did we learn all this while? Contact processor. Yeah. <laughs> Contact process is what SO2 to SO3 is. You're absolutely right. You know, uh, of course, uh, we didn't go that far. Uh, what we said is, hey, there is a mixture of SO2 and SO3, and at the temperatures at which they were operating, uh, there was uh, uh, more amount of SO3 than SO2 because it keeps changing. And so we said, why don't we follow uh, the absorption process? Just like we do, na? the intermediate stream of SO2 and SO3, you take out the SO3 and then you are left with SO2, right? Uh, in the double contact, double absorption process, what do we do with SO2, SO3? After the third bed? So we take out SO3 so that it comes right. back. Right. You take out SO3. And what do you take out SO3 in? What do you absorb it in? Concentrated sulfuric acid. Absolutely. In fact, the proposal was made that why don't we pass this flue gas through concentrated sulfuric acid? Just like as if you are doing a contact process where you have got an SO2, SO3. And of course, there are complexities. It's not that simple because uh, flue gas also has carbon dioxide in it. But the carbon dioxide is a much weaker acid than sulfuric acid, so the carbon dioxide will just come out. You know? So will the SO2. Okay? And only the SO3 will react and your concentrated sulfuric acid will become more concentrated sulfuric acid, like we have learned. Now, what you do is that you're left with carbon dioxide plus SO2. Now you pass that through the sodium hydroxide. You now require less sodium hydroxide because uh, a lot of the SO3 has already become sulfuric acid. I don't uh, need to scrub that. So I, I do it for the rest. And the beauty is 
Now what you will get is pure sodium sulfide. Initially, what will happen is these will react. Uh, even the carbon dioxide will react. It will form sodium carbonate plus sodium sulfide. And as more and more SO2 comes, the sodium carbonate will break up because SO2 is a stronger acid than CO2, and so sodium carbonate will become sodium sulfide, and the CO2 will finally uh, go off, uh, free of uh, your SO2 and SO3. You know? So you have got three advantages in a way. One, you have they require sulfur uh, sulfuric acid as a feedstock. A lot of their leaching operations, etc., involve use of sulfuric acid. So obviously, one is that you are increasing the strength of the sulfuric acid. Second, you are reducing the cost of the NOH uh, because I require less. And third, because now you get a pure sodium sulfide as compared to earlier, they were getting a mixture of sodium sulfide and sodium sulfate, which had a less value. You know, now you get pure sodium sulfide, so it attracted a higher price. Why am I talking about it in terms of sulfuric acid? Because the roasting of catalyst did lead to some production of sulfuric acid. But what is important is that who can do it? If you are familiar with this plot, then you know what, what it means. If you don't know anything and SO2, SO3, temperature, they all sound the same to you. You know, then of course you can't do it. Okay, is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You can just see, like for example, this from a trial. You start with about say 98% sulfuric acid, and it became like oleum. This is the uh, the amount of uh, 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 sulfuric acid which you got, which means the the SO3 part which became uh, H2SO4, and the SO2 part, you know, which ended up in a sodium sulfide uh, due to the uh, due to this, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of error here and there, uh, but whatever is the total stream concentration, and if you directly absorb it into sodium hydroxide and estimate, you know, the two tallied quite well. So uh, there was a reduction in the use of sodium hydroxide. Plus, you ended up getting sulfuric acid, and you ended up with a pure sodium sulfide. So, so that's the sum and substance of the uh, of the invention, which was granted a patent this year. I hope you can understand how you can apply knowledge uh, into your problems, you know, as as they come along. Now, take a, another case. You'll find a reference to this in Dryden's book on the chapter on cement. And you'll come to see it later on, as I told you, that uh, the largest use of sulfuric acid uh, is in fertilizer production. Uh, and you end up with a byproduct, phosphogypsum, which is basically calcium sulfate. There's a huge mountain of this uh, phosphogypsum, uh, which is there in all industries who are uh, uh, producing uh, Phosphate fertilizers from uh, from rock phosphate. Of course, that has come to uh, a grinding halt almost in India, and we have started importing uh, phosphoric acid and uh, uh, phosphate fertilizers. But if it were to change again, the scenario in the future, uh, all that phosphogypsum uh, would be available. Another source of gypsum is uh, seawater, which you'll see later on that uh, you can generate uh, large amounts of uh, gypsum uh, in the course of uh, producing NaCl salt. So there's going to be uh, gypsum, uh, which is uh, going to be available. And you could actually integrate that uh, with the production of cement. Now, let me uh, just tell you uh, how that is done. In fact, you'll see this kind of a chemistry later on uh, when we talk about the Leblanc process. You can take gypsum, you can uh, introduce coal, and it will get converted into carbon dioxide plus calcium sulfide. The calcium sulfide can react with more amount of uh, gypsum, and it will get converted into lime plus SO2. So you can actually get a lot of SO2 uh, from this kind of a, a process. The lime, of course, subsequently reacts with uh, silica, alumina, and iron oxide, and that's what gives you Portland cement. You know. 
so you get things like tricalcium uh, silicate uh, dicalcium silicate or uh, calcium aluminate and also some amount of uh, uh, calcium oxide with aluminum oxide and ferric oxide and these are the various phases which is known as clinker which are obtained uh, during cement production that's your cement portland cement so if you were to like let's say produce uh, cement uh, using gypsum uh, instead of using say uh, limestone you know because that also you can burn and you'll get co2 and uh, you'll get calcium oxide and then that can react uh, but if you do it this way uh, then uh, you know you might be able to get byproduct so2 and again there would be the whole issue of impurities etc because you are taking coal as your feedstock now the so2 will also come partly from coal and but mostly from your uh, gypsum so this in the future could be your source of so2 and here again the same issues that you had raised before that is impurities and how do you separate it out uh, those would be the crucial things to consider so we'll put it but impurities would be a concern and uh, and their separation okay but if you could do that you know then this could be a future source of your so2 for the contact process i hope you can see uh, various approaches uh, in how you might be able to conceive of new kinds of uh, ways of solving uh, uh, the problem because we will require sulfuric acid there's no doubt about it you know i i think there's just way too many applications which require sulfuric acid i cannot emphasize that uh, those will disappear so uh, we'll have to look for alternative feedstock this comes to the other point where uh, uh, one of you had said uh, can we not recycle okay. now let's see uh, what are the kinds of things that happen to the sulfuric acid one as i told you uh, 60 to 70% goes to the fertilizer industry and effectively form gypsum we have seen how you might be able to deal with that gypsum and get uh, uh, so2 out of it another application and especially in uh, a lot of the organic chemical industries wherever you are carrying out a, a reaction with uh, alkali for example what do people do after the reaction is over the work up involves uh, neutralization with uh, sulfuric acid uh, you form uh, basically sodium sulfate or uh, if you are using uh, lime as a alkali it will form calcium sulfate whatever it is but just consider the case where you are uh, having sodium hydroxide as a uh, alkali or sodium carbonate and then you are neutralizing with uh, sulfuric acid so you end up generating uh, sodium sulfate you know, and this creates a huge amount of problem uh, for the industry because uh, they are not allowed to discharge so much of salts because then the salinity of the water the liquid effluent will become very high these people have been told that you have to solve your problem so you cannot discharge so much of sodium sulfate not to speak of the fact that uh, you are uh, really consuming so much of uh, uh, alkali and acid in the in the process the ideal situation would be if for example there was a technology whereby you could recycle the alkali so that uh, there's no need to neutralize you know that's approach one if if you are using alkali now if you cannot come up with a solution to that and if you are making sodium sulfate what is sodium sulfate you can think of it as a acid base reaction between sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid the question is can i convert sodium sulfate back into sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide because the companies will require both they will require the alkali for the reaction and acid for neutralization so if i could do that then i could continuously recycle now this technology is known as bipolar electrolysis so let me just quickly explain to you what it is there are three types of membranes 
one is a cation exchange membrane one is an anion exchange membrane and the other is basically a sandwich of an anion and cation exchange membrane which is known as a bipolar membrane what is the dissociation constant of water how much is it 10 to the power minus 14 absolutely what does it mean in terms of h plus and oh minus their concentrations 10 to the power minus 7 both will have absolutely. that concentration all right and that's why your ph of water is 7 this membrane what it does is that in the presence of uh, an electric field it can take water and split it up into oh minus and h plus and because uh, say this part is a cation exchange membrane so the h plus only can migrate through this membrane and come to this side and the oh minus which was formed passes through the anion exchange membrane this is a sandwich of anion and cation exchange membrane and it goes to this side on the left hand side oh minus and so uh, your dissociation constant of water which is 10 to the power minus 14 under normal conditions uh, when you apply an electric field i can change it and i can make it uh, very high uh, i can get large amounts of h plus and oh minus created if you are passing sodium sulfate feed your waste stream from one from here and another from here now what happens is that uh, in this thing one is a positive electrode and one is a negative electrode now the anions will tend to move towards the positive electrode and the cations will tend to move towards the negative electrode now what happens is that this is a cation exchange membrane so this oh minus which came here it cannot pass through this membrane because it's a cation exchange membrane and this is an anion but the the sodium ions because it wants to move towards the negative electrode so they will pass through the cation exchange membrane and it will become effectively sodium ion will accumulate here now i have got oh minus here and i have got sodium ions here obviously it will form sodium hydroxide from this side uh, from this particular compartment i can draw out sodium hydroxide what will happen uh, uh, here uh, here because it's an anion exchange membrane my cation h plus which i generated here cannot pass through okay because it's an anion exchange membrane so uh, the h plus will just remain here the sodium sulfate which i put in now the sulfate will tend to migrate towards the positive electrode and this is an anion exchange membrane so the sulfate can move through so effectively what i have done is that the h plus plus the sulfate over here will form sulfuric acid so i can draw sulfuric acid from this particular compartment and you don't have only one cell pair like this you know this is known as a cell pair there will be 20 30 such cell pairs uh, alternate uh, the chambers will give you sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid obviously one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that this you, there is no free lunch nothing is for free so what am i paying what is the price i am paying what is the penalty what is the price so water so what is the total penalty that i uh, will pay other than water as you say If one is that i don't get concentrated sulfuric acid in nao here you know i actually get dilute stream so uh, if i but in many cases i don't really require very concentrated acid than alkalis maybe a dilute acid and alkali will do the job and if it doesn't then i'll have to strip of water you know that's of course another penalty you know any other penalty electricity yes absolutely so one you said water and then you said electricity absolutely there is no free lunch you know you are obviously driving a non spontaneous process so it requires energy and that is electrical energy in this particular case 
you will see this time and time again you know when we uh, go through this course what you will find is that if you had a source of energy uh, thermal energy and electrical energy you can actually do wonders the key issue is how do i generate limitless energy we discussed you know whether it is uh, nuclear energy or what people think will be the future which is nuclear fuel you know if these technologies come into play and if i can generate power and heat the sky is the limit in what you can do you know so what i would also suggest to you all is that when you are conceiving ideas for the future lift that constraint that uh, because otherwise you'll come to a dead end with everything and you'll say yes but it requires energy but in this age scenario in the future maybe 50 years from now where there is limitless energy and now the question is what are the most appropriate technologies considering that uh, don't be uh, totally turned off uh, by uh, technologies like this maybe they will become increasingly relevant in the years to come this is another uh, way by the way of uh, doing the same uh, uh, thing the only difference is that in this particular case you pump hydrogen you know hydrogen becomes h plus and now i don't need a bipolar membrane i can have just simple anion and uh, cation exchange membrane you know but otherwise play the same game uh, so if i'm passing let's say sodium chloride the chloride will go through here i'll get hcl and this is a cation exchange membrane so my sodium ion will go this way and here my water will basically get split into uh, oh minus an h plus or h2 and you can think of that that h2 is being recycled here and this oh minus and na plus will form sodium hydroxide so uh, pretty good approaches to uh, generating this kind of uh, acid and alkali let me tell you that these are uh, uh, not just curious phenomena you know uh, there there are companies today who are selling this kind of bipolar uh, uh, membrane units uh, they will share with you data on uh, uh, what kind of sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid concentrations you can get uh, in fact in uh, in this particular approach that i showed you uh, this particular approach uh, you can get uh, naoh and h2so4 uh, up to 20% concentrations which is not bad it's pretty good if you were to join a company where uh, uh, you identify such problems and many times you know i i remember so many companies if i gone and talk to them they would say really there is something like this you never knew this so even educating the senior management in what is possible okay, is important and that's the kind of thing that uh, you might have to uh, do okay uh, in in companies okay let me take you through another example of a possible future scenario uh, of making uh, uh, sulfuric acid now this is very interesting these are seaweeds and you can grow them in vast amounts uh, in the sea uh, these are bamboo rafts you know you can tie strings uh, put strands of this uh, germplasm and just leave it there for a uh, for uh, maybe two months and you'll get uh, copious amounts of this uh, uh, algae growing now this algae presently uh, is being converted into a, a bio fertilizer it the juice of the algae the sap uh, is a very very potent uh, fertilizer is being marketed now by ifco based on the technology that was licensed by us uh, about what 20 years ago or 15 years ago Okay. and then you also get a granule uh, a residue and this residue contains polysaccharides you know and this polysaccharide is known as carrageenan and if you hydrolyze it you will end up with things like uh, galactose sugar uh, those kinds of sugars uh, you'll get uh, out of it and that's what it is used for so so this algae is being grown today for 
uh, this product and this product. Now, another very interesting thing about this algae uh, is that it accumulates a lot of potassium from the seawater and it's very rich in potassium. You know? And so one of the reasons why these plants, etc., are growing so well uh, is that the juice uh, has got high levels of uh, potassium, although that's not the only reason. Uh, they've got a lot of growth hormone, uh, which are useful for uh, the development of the plant. And here also you'll see uh, that these are sulfated polysaccharides and the counter ion uh, of this sulfate is potassium. You know? So there is a source of potassium. Now, one could also imagine a future scenario where uh, these things are being cultivated not just for uh, use of this stuff uh, in sophisticated applications, like those sophisticated applications would be like a gum in making pet food, like uh, your uh, pedigree cat food, dog food, you know, has things like this, gives it the texture. Or it goes into things like uh, 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 into added as an additive into ice cream uh, to prevent the nucleation of uh, ice into big big ice crystals, you know. And so you get a creamy uh, taste of your ice uh, ice cream. Okay? Many other applications, like as a flocculating agent while you're clarifying beer. So lots of these applications, but it could be that in future you may just want to grow large amounts of this stuff and just burn it. If you burn it, uh, one is that you can use it as a biomass, you can generate heat and you can utilize that heat energy. You will get a fertilizer you know, which you can use and you will get sulfur dioxide maybe which you can use in the contact process. This could be another future scenario of where you will end up getting your uh, SO2 from. So. Uh, all is not lost. I mean, even if your uh, crude oil uh, uh, reserves come down and and you are left with uh, no crude oil, uh, you could in the future, maybe uh, 30, 40, 50 years from now, uh, see all these kinds of technologies uh, coming into play. Any questions? Have all of you understood the alternative approaches? Yes. 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 Sir. Okay. Now, this was another thing that one of you said, uh, and uh, so I told you one was this electrodialysis type of approach where you can take not sulfuric acid, but the salts derived from sulfuric acid, and you might be able to regenerate uh, sulfuric acid. But there could be also others where uh, you, you actually have sulfuric acid. Like, for example, if you have a lead acid battery, and the, the electrolyte is what? It's sulfuric acid. Uh, and if your lead acid battery has stopped functioning, uh, but the sulfuric acid is still there, so you might be able to recycle such uh, sulfuric acid. You know? Or consider like you're doing, uh, uh, let's say, sulfonation chemistry. Uh, uh, you're making dyes you know, using sulfuric acid or oleum. Now, uh, after the uh, sulfonation is done, most of the time what happens is that they don't reuse that sulfuric acid because there's a lot of organics etc which have gone into it, uh, there can be contamination. So what you can do uh, is uh, this is one approach that if let's say you have got sulfuric acid with uh, some amount of organics which have gotten to the sulfuric acid, uh, things which have got dissolved in it then you might be able to do a steam stripping and with the help of steam, high temperature uh, steam, uh, you can strip off the organics. Okay? And you might be able to even condense these organics and maybe uh, if, if, if some of it is uh, useful, you can recycle it in some way or you can burn it and generate energy out of it. If there are nitrogenous substances, uh, some of those things might come out as NOx, you know, which you might have to treat. And then after you have taken out the, uh, uh, the uh, organics, you know, uh, because uh, in most of these cases, the, uh, the sulfuric acid may be a bit dilute, you know, uh, it may not be absolutely concentrated uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, so you may want to subject it to distillation and remove water 
and you can reuse the water i mean it will be just condensed water and you can do uh, two lots of uh, distillation if one is not enough uh, under different conditions because uh, the temperature requirement for distillation will be very different depending on the concentration of the sulfuric acid as you uh, make the sulfuric acid more concentrated uh, you'll have to strip off water at a much higher temperature you know so uh, you might be able to uh, uh, do this get your uh, water for recycle and you have got your uh, you cool the mass after that you know you can do heat integration uh, between your sulfuric acid and the heat that you uh, generate from some of these uh, operations okay. and you might be able to just get back regenerated sulfuric acid and use it there is no need to always produce new sulfuric acid this technique will not be suitable uh, for the lead acid battery for example the sulfuric acid that you get from that can anyone tell me why why it may not be suitable excuse me sir please could you repeat the question yeah i'm just saying that i showed you this steam stripping and i told you how it is applied in like let's say if you have got a, a, a chemical industry where a lot of different organics are being uh, produced and you are doing sulfonation uh, chemistry uh, how you might be able to regenerate uh, sulfuric acid after it's done its sulfonation job you know? uh, but the question i am asking you is that can i use this approach to also recover sulfuric acid from let's say a lead acid battery waste which is also sulfuric acid yes or no no sir why no sir the concentration of the sulfuric acid inside the battery will decrease right see yeah, but i can strip off water na and uh, i can increase the concentration yes so the substances that are suspended like the non volatile matter that you have not really and really this is okay when i am got volatile but when i am in a lead acid battery there no organics the only reason why the battery goes bad is because of probably uh, uh, certain impurities from the electrode you know, or from your uh, metal casing which go into the sulfuric acid and they are all uh, non volatile stuff you know they are not volatile so this is not going to get rid of those is it clear very yes, nice sir. so what do i do in those cases what should i do if i have got non volatile stuff is there any solution that you can think of think uh, a bit out of the box think radically don't try to think incrementally from this figure and don't be shy if it is a wild answer and you are wrong don't worry about it we can form salts of lead ah you are saying that you precipitate out the impurities right yes sir huh? yes sir okay that would be a good approach if you could do it can one precipitate out so but there are numerous impurities involved so how will we get specific for each Absolutely, type of impurity that's the problem you know but when there are uh, uh, numerous and some even unknown and some unknown impurities this approach may not be full you might be able to take out some things but not all things but it's a great approach nothing wrong with what you have said i want a full proof approach from you no okay <clears throat> this is something uh, which you will encounter in uh, uh, situations where uh, if i have got an impurity uh, in uh, Uh, something in something okay uh, one approach uh, is 
or or your mind will always go uh, towards uh, removing that impurity uh, suppose i've got uh, salts in my water and i uh, do ro reverse osmosis you know what do i do am i removing the impurities or am i removing the actual product from the impurity so i can remove from the impurities the from well, the water goes through right the pure water permeates through and it leaves behind all the salts similar would be the case that i am doing thermal distillation where i am i'm i'm actually distilling of the uh, uh, the water and all the impurities are left behind in the residue okay uh, on the other hand uh, if i were looking at uh, uh, this kind of you know the electrolysis type of approach you know we are actually trying to uh, not the specific thing that i told you over there but there, there are other approaches to electrolysis where you remove the impurities uh, from the water you know uh, you don't move the water as such so there's a fundamental difference between the two here what you can do is especially when you have got let's say very concentrated sulfuric acid uh, like in a uh, in the lead acid battery it doesn't have much water so can i can i reverse the whole process can i reverse the process how would i reverse the process of making sulfuric acid which you have learned how did you make sulfuric acid so from so2 so we will we'll use the produce sulfuric acid to get back so2 right reason why this, this is you can do is that because especially when you have got concentrated sulfuric acid it doesn't have much water and even if it has water you first strip it off and you try to remove most of the uh, water and crazy as it seems what you do is that you form a spray of the sulfuric acid you can see compressed air the compressed air is being pushed in to the sulfuric acid and it's coming out like a jet and where is it going it's going into a furnace obviously that furnace has to have a special lining so that it doesn't get attacked by the sulfuric acid and that furnace operates at something like 1000 to 1200 degrees centigrade and what will happen i mean i will basically uh, carry out the process in reverse and because the temperature is about 1000 1200 degree centigrade so i will not get uh, so3 so i'll end up getting so2 uh, we know from that equilibria so you will end up getting so2 h2o and o2 from this then what you can do uh, is that uh, you can take it below the dew point perhaps and remove the water and then uh, the rest of your so2 along with whatever o2 you have and then it's as if you are uh, uh, redoing the the contact process uh, and just uh, remake sulfuric acid and all your impurities within all of that stuff uh, will basically remain in your furnace it will not come out here into the gas phase because they are non volatile has everybody understood this yes okay sir. and this process is known as the satco process invented by ron polank sulfuric acid by thermal cracking oxidation this is the kind of innovativeness which you will find over and over again uh, in industrial uh, chemical processes there are people who are able to think out of the box and remember you are doing it because you could not find an alternative solution uh, sulfuric acid is such a concentrated thing that even if you think of ion exchange resins or things like that which would normally work under uh, if you have an aqueous stream you know water uh, so many things can be removed by uh, ion exchange columns but with the with those kinds of uh, sulfuric acid the resins will get chewed up and so you may not be able to use it and if there is some degradation of the resins uh, you can make a bad problem worse because those things can come into the sulfuric acid you will require uh, this kind of an out of the box uh, uh, thinking any questions from anyone sir i have a small question sir yeah 
So uh, you talked about the lead acid battery. So I did not understand how we'll um, basically uh, disable the impurities in the lead acid batteries. I'm just draining out the sulfuric acid and the impurities will all be metallic impurities. Typically uh, some sorts of uh, uh, metals, they are not going to be volatile. My job is to try and recover sulfuric acid. I may or may not even use it in the same lead acid battery. I might use it somewhere else. So by doing this regeneration and recovering sulfuric acid as a gas phase SO2, I leave all the other impurities behind as solids. Is that clear? Yes, sir, now it's clear. Thank you, sir. By the way, I should also mention that SO2 itself has many different uses. One of those, of course, we will discuss when we are talking about sugar processing, uh, but it's also a very good solvent. Uh, it's used in uh, some of the petrochemical refinery processes and also uh, in uh, organic synthesis. So bear that in mind. With that, we now have come to the end of sulfuric acid. We will start with the next topic uh, just to introduce it. And that will be soda ash. Just like you found that sulfuric uh, acid is a huge commodity uh, chemical, so is soda ash. Just to give you an idea, I, I, I just found this data. 2019 uh, market size uh, was about uh, 16 billion US dollars. Okay. That, that's the global uh, market for uh, soda ash. If you look at soda ash, etc., there or sulfuric acid, they're all so boring to look at. You know, white powders or uh, viscous liquid like uh, sulfuric acid. But beyond that, there's, there's nothing that is appealing uh, about these chemicals. What makes these chemicals appealing and why it is so important to study them is because of their end utility. Uh, so, for example, you take uh, soda ash, there are of course two types of soda ash. One is the heavy soda ash with a high density and then there's a light soda ash, which is uh, uh, the kind of stuff that uh, uh, you will use in uh, things like food and drinks and uh, brine treatment, uh, stuff like that. And the heavy soda ash goes into some of the bulk chemical industries like the metallurgical industry, largely about 80% goes into glass manufacture. The glass industry was the one that gave birth to enormous creativity in trying to devise a new kind of a, a technology for making soda ash, which is ultimately what led to the solvay process. But it's huge. And the people who were uh, big in the early days of the industrial revolution uh, when uh, the technology was developed uh, were the french you know the french had the uh, the they were probably the most uh, well known uh, for their work on uh, on glass the french were feeling a shortage of uh, raw material and that's what uh, motivated them uh, to have a uh, a contest which uh, ultimately led to the new technology of soda ash. Before I come to soda ash, and because we said about 80% uh, of the heavy soda, uh, which is the bulk of the soda, uh, which uh, goes into glass, you know, uh, let me, uh, you can always ask, but where, where is it used? You know, where, where does it go? Okay. Uh, and I want you to learn the subjects like that, you know, uh, because that is what makes it more interesting. So, uh, I mean, if you take the basics of uh, uh, soda ash and glass, uh, you can think of it as if I'm taking silica, SiO2, and if I'm cooking it up with sodium carbonate, and I'll end up with sodium silicate, uh, the carbon dioxide will go off, you know, and these are the kinds of things uh, which will give me glass. On the other hand, if I take pure silica and if I heat it up to very high temperatures, 2000 degree or thereabouts, what do you get? What material you will get? What type of glass from pure silica? Quartz. 
yes quartz but you know quartz is so difficult to process okay that it cannot be a practical way of making glass quartz you can use for very specialized application like for example if i am making a a quartz prism things like that okay but uh, the regular glass that we all use is not quartz it's basically uh, what we call as polarized uh, glass and uh, effectively what it is is that you have a silica network so this is all your silica network sio2 network but what happens is that when i uh, uh, cook it up with things like calcium carbonate and uh, uh, sodium carbonate so rash these impurities tend to go into the interstices they go into the pores of this network 3d network that is created and you know obviously it generates some level of imperfection in the in the way these sio2s can aggregate and it's because of that that there is a lowering of the temperature at which these things will melt and liquefy so uh, effectively that's what it does you know and it can lower uh, temperatures to uh, something like uh, Thousand degree centigrade or less. You can even make glass at about seven hundred degree centigrade. The typical glass blowers, you know, you go to them and uh, they will do your beakers and stuff like that. Those are all uh, done at about seven eight hundred uh, degree centigrade. Tomorrow, uh, I will continue with uh, with soda ash, okay? and I'll continue with this slide. Everybody understood? Yes, sir. Okay. See you yes, tomorrow. Sir. Thank you sir. Thank you sir.